Trick or treat? It is Halloween once again, and I come to you today to tell the tale of the single scariest movie ever to haunt a television screen. A film so terrifying that catching five minutes of it while channel surfing in a hotel room was enough to put my younger self off an entire cable network for years. Because it was where the scary movie lived. The lurking place of... The year 2000 Disney Channel original movie, The Phantom of the Megaplex. Now, yes, as I've covered on this channel before, I have a history of being scared of, like, everything, honestly. But also, as I've covered before, I have recently made a complete 180 on that front. I haven't quite reached the Alex Goldman level of watching A Nightmare on Elm Street to relax me at 3 in the morning when I can't sleep, but I have come around to the point where if I want to have a movie night and I don't have anything in particular in mind, I start browsing the streaming service in the horror section. I am constantly checking Blumhouse trash out from the library to keep on hand for emergency cheer up at the end of a garbage day, Scream and Ready or Not were the movies that held me tight through a breakup, X and The Invitation were how I decompressed after crunching to get my last video out on time, and Crimson Peak was my pregame for a second date. I've even started tentatively dipping a toe into horror games, admittedly extremely skittishly, but still, something I thought I'd never be able to work my way up to. And checking out an in-person haunt has started to feel like a question of when I'll be ready, not if. I'm a whole new goddamn person, so I think it's time to revisit this work of abject terror, see how it holds up. Let's watch The Phantom of the Megaplex. Phantom of the Megaplex follows Pete, the 17-year-old junior manager of the Grand Megaplex, and the rest of its staff, a team of teenagers with adorably apt names. That's Terry Tutora, nicknamed Scary Terry. She's got a hundred stories to tell, and all of them end in death and destruction. Look at a great job we're doing, honey. Aren't we so efficient? Hillary Horan, a.k.a. Hillary Honey. Mark Jeffries, <laughs> or as I call him, question mark. That's Ricky Larry. Or as we call him, Ricky Rules. Lacey Lane, a.k.a. Racy Lacey. Why walk if you can run? Their senior manager, Sean, and unofficial volunteer mascot, Movie Mason, on the night of the premiere screening of a much-hyped monster flick called Midnight Mayhem, which the Suburban Joint has managed to wrangle onto their schedule. On top of the high pressure of making sure the premiere goes off without a hitch, Pete is tasked with occasionally checking in on his younger siblings, Karen and Brian, who have been dropped off to see a movie while their mom is on a date, and with impressing his crush, Caitlin, whom he managed to score tickets for an evening movie followed by the premiere, but who is also being pursued by mean guy Donnie Holly. And as if all that wasn't enough, the level of additional operational chaos quickly bubbles past what could be explained by a busy night and some bad luck toward seemingly deliberate sabotage. Brian, who refuses to stay put in his theater, becomes convinced this is all the work of the Phantom of the Megaplex, a local legend about the ghost of a movie lover who was trapped in the old single-screen theater when it was demolished to make way for the Grand, and quickly gets Karen on his side. Pete, way over his head, finally accepts his little sibling's help, and they point out that a number of the issues that have cropped up are directly related to the movies being screened. Also, you know, a mysterious figure in a cloak and a mask is sneaking around, so yeah. Sabotage! The kids theorize that the Phantom is probably planning some sort of related chaos for the premiere, so they look up the plot of Midnight Mayhem on a spoiler site and find out that in the climactic scene, the monster traps all of the humans in one room and grows so big it sucks out all of the air. Conveniently, the giant inflatable midnight monster that had been perched on top of the Megaplex to hype up the premiere has gone missing. Aha! Pete deflates the monster and unmasks the phantom who turns out to be Sean, taking revenge on the theater's owner, Wolfgang Niedermeyer, for passing him over for a promotion in favor of a nepotism hire. You think LaMonica will be a better GM than I will? So be it. 
but don't come crying to me when you find out that you're wrong. Pete gets an offer to take over his job, which he turns down in favor of a newly found work-life balance. I guess what I figured out tonight is that I need to spend more time having a life. He gets the girl, apparently, plus a new stepdad, happy ending, roll credits. So like, a lot of the time when I do these summaries at the beginning of the video, I'm very tongue-in-cheek about it because that's just sort of how I write, but in this case, where I'm talking about a movie that scared the absolute pants off me as a kid, I think it's important to point out that the tone I've established here is actually like completely in line with the movie itself. You know, a lot of the time I look back on stuff that freaked me out when I was little and there will be at least one moment where it's like, yeah, someone really did not think all the way through who their target audience was supposed to be. Like Muppet Treasure Island. Man, I was so embarrassed of how scared I was of Muppet Treasure Island, but that opening number is fucking creepy, dude. Shiver my timbers, shiver my sail. This is a children's show. This is not one of those cases. I really don't think this is a movie that was even intended to be a little scary for kids who like being a little scared. Even within the limits of where the Disney Channel was willing to go on that end, it is very mild. Like, you can tell the difference between, like, the Halloween Town movies that have some baby's first macabre elements, or even, like, the Halloween episodes of some of the TV shows. Phantom of the Megaplex is not really spooky, or trying to be by those standards. It's a silly movie where a service worker has a comically stressful day on the job and ultimately saves the day with some help from his loving family who love movies. It's got enough of the aesthetic of spook to fit into an annual Halloween marathon. An evil phantom haunts people in a the movie theater. Does he talk during the movie? Worse. Wow, this guy really is evil. And there are a handful of overblown misdirection type scares, but on the whole it's way more treats than tricks. Let's discuss some of them now! Exhibit A, what the fuck is Midnight Mayhem? What is this movie? Who is this carnival face paint devil guy? And why is he the sole face of the trailer for what otherwise sounds like a kaiju movie? I would pay so many US dollars to see this thing. Speaking of, Exhibit B, fake movies. As one might expect, all of the films that are actually playing at the Megaplex are non-existent titles invented for this movie. Mom, can Karen and I see Farmer Brown goes to town tonight? What if I pay you five bucks and take you to see Power Penguins for Olympic glory next weekend? And no corpse school! I'm guessing she means University of Death. Glimpses of Genevieve has been nominated for more awards than all five of last year's Oscar Jeez, nominees. But this actually goes a step further. Every pop culture artifact the characters ever reference is a fake one. Sometimes these are really obvious parodies on existing titles. What's well, his name from Laughlin Streams coming to? I don't wanna wait. Others are more whole cloth inventions based on the specific needs of the moment. You sound exactly like the grouchy old dad in blank screen. Maybe he finally wants to be appreciated and recognized. Like Willie Gaines in The Last Woodcarver. This is like James Raymond in Healy's Cove. Oh yeah, exactly. The only exception to this is The Phantom of the Opera, which is mentioned by name as the first first film shown at that old single-screen theater that opened in-universe in 1925, which is consistent with the actual silent film adaptation of The Phantom of the Opera starring Lawton Chaney. The movie actually uses a small amount of footage from it. And kids, you know what that means? The Phantom of the Megaplex is secretly a multiverse movie set in an alternate history with a divergent point sometime between 1925 and 2000! What happened? Leave your guesses in the comments! To which end? Exhibit C. Battery commercials. Just like those battery commercials! We put the exact amount in for one batch like we always do, but it just keeps going and going and going. Aha! I was a regular viewer of United States television in the 1990s. I understood that reference. It keeps going and going and going and going going and going and going. So no matter what divergent point of history led to an entirely different canon of all post-silent era movies in this universe, as Wendy Dillon said in Maybe Baby, until you apply the headlock, he, he might, might never, never comply, comply with, with wedlock. wedlock. Battery company Duracell still ran a 1973 television advertising campaign showing a room full of drumming bunny toys draining their batteries and stopping their drumming one by one until the bunny with a Duracell battery was the last still going. And rival battery company Energizer still ran a 1988 parody where a bright pink Sonic the Hedgehog type edgy bunny burst in with a bass drum, and Duracell still had not trademarked their drumming bunny, so Energizer was still 
still able to gain exclusive rights to the character in the US and Canada in an out-of-court settlement, still resulting in a decades-long ad campaign that still cemented itself as a cultural mainstay, with the running joke being that the same battery from 1988 was still going and going and going. Or someone else somehow organically came up with the same slogan for the same product. But it just keeps going and going and going. Exhibit D, Pete eating lunch. Look at this kid. I wish I enjoyed anything as much as this absolute gremlin enjoys just going to town on four whole cans of beefaroni dumped into the biggest mixing bowl in the house. Living is bliss. Good for him. Slow down, Grog. Nobody's gonna steal your woolly mammoth meat. Exhibit E, there is an entire chunk of the plot and a whole goofy fake out scare that entirely hinge on the movie taking place and honestly being viewed in the exact sweet spot of mobile communication technology of the year 2000 specifically. Pete was originally supposed to drive Brian and Karen home after their movie, but too many people called off work on the most important night of the decade, so Sean cancelled everyone's dinner breaks, put a pin in it, so Pete can't leave. Pete's mom's boyfriend, George, has a cell phone, but he's the only one. Pete has access to the payphone in the lobby of the Megaplex, but is presumably calling upon his own memory of phone numbers rather than an exhaustive list of everyone he might possibly need to call ever, so he calls his mom's pager so she can call the payphone back on George's cell phone. But obviously Pete can't be monitoring the lobby payphone all night with a phantom causing chaos and his senior manager mysteriously missing in action all dang night, so what about when mom needs to get a hold of Pete? Calling the Megaplex directly just gets her a series of recorded messages, but George reminds her that her pager has a callback function so she can recall the number of the lobby payphone to call it again from George's cell phone. City morgue. Kids today will never know, am I right? Exhibit F, George, Pete's mom's boyfriend, whom her kids are obsessed with her marrying. Mom's going out with George tonight. Oh, I think you might finally propose. I don't really know what to make of this. Tell him how great you look in white, ask him if he wants to play old maid, and then tell him you'll give him a ring when you get home. Do kids act like this? Remember, no headlock, no wedlock. I'll believe it when I see it. Go on! Here. Exhibit G, these adorably tiny packages of straws. What is that, like a 20 pack? For a movie theater concession stand? On a Saturday night? Where are the rest of them? And why aren't they wrapped in plastic? Like, even if they're not individually wrapped, these rubber bands make no sense. That shit should be in a bag. This makes no sense for transport, and it's gotta be a health code violation to boot. Exhibit H, class politics and the goddamn American dream. Seriously. Okay, let's break this one down to some subpoints. Exhibit H.1, cinema as art versus business. Yes, I said class politics. We'll get there. Bear with me. This is embodied in a pair of dialectic relationships. Most clearly, we've got Sean the middle manager versus movie Mason. Mason, played by the late Mickey Rooney, comes from the family who owned the original movie theater that was demolished and replaced by the Grand Megaplex. He doesn't officially work for the Grand, but he does show up every day and act like he does, and all the regular customers know and love him. Sean, you'll remember, is the senior manager in charge of pulling off a red carpet premiere on the day he he's been informed that he's being passed over for a promotion in favor of the owner's son-in-law. Sean is in this business so he can someday be like his boss. He seems to have some level of passion for customer service. Tonight, as the eyes of the entertainment world fall upon our humble megaplex, what I want them to see is greatness. And for movies themselves. I have not missed a single one of your films, sir. But it all comes back to wanting to be a super rich dude with the level of influence to go out to dinner with Hollywood directors and whatnot. Mason, on the other hand, is all about the noble, glittery magic of the movies. To destroy that magic, to shatter those moments, to me is a sin so grave as to be almost incomprehensible. At one point, he steps in as a ticket taker to make up for the amount of the staff who have called out, and he almost starts a riot by refusing to let customers waste their money on a movie he thinks sucks. Cinema is sacred. Each experience should transport us to a world worthy of our time and hard-earned cash. 
Okay. Sean throws him out in a moment that is very much framed as the triumph of soulless, profit-driven business over freedom, beauty, truth, and love. You can't treat Movie Mason like this! He's a legend! Yeah! Not to me! Meanwhile, the same dynamic plays out between Pete and his little siblings. Maybe it's because we have fun, Mr. Assistant Manager. Something you obviously can't relate to. Why? Because I'd rather earn a few bucks than sit in a dark theater daydreaming? The kiddos love movies more than anything. No offense, but I can see you anytime. I'm here to see a movie. A love learned or inherited from their dad, who is implied to have died some years ago. Uh, no one says this out loud, but they only talk about him in the past tense and without a whiff of conflict. Who loves movies more than dad? Yeah. Pete, on the other hand, could give a fuck about movies, except that they give him a job. Well, no disrespect, Mom, but I'm in it strictly for the cold, hard cash. Which leads me to Exhibit H.2, Pete's American Dream. Pete, at age 17, is already neck deep in the rat race. His mom thinks he works too hard. I'll work in no play. It's gonna make me really, really rich. He has no time to have fun with his little siblings. You're so locked into achievement mode, you're like the oldest living teenager I know. And crucially, it doesn't seem like his mom is counting on him to help pay the bills here. The Rileys live in a nice suburban house, the little siblings go to the movies very regularly, and Karen has enough money left over, presumably allowance, to use it to bribe Brian. Ten bucks, power penguins, and a large candy of your choice. Let me think about it. Mom tells Pete he works too hard without any of the internal conflict that you'd expect to see from a parent who wants her kid to enjoy being young, but also needs his help to keep the electric bill paid. Pete, you're young. You have plenty of years to work. You should be out enjoying yourself. She and George are supposed to have dinner at Chez Patrice, presumably a reference to Berkeley, California restaurant Chez Panisse, which at the time of writing costs a flat $175 a head for the tasting menu, which is the only option in the main dining room. And they're not even celebrating anything. This is just a normal Saturday night that only leads up to a proposal because it unexpectedly needs a cinematic ending. Unfortunately, I uh, don't have uh, a ring yet. Pardon me, sir, may I offer you uh, this loaner? Actually, while we're at it, Exhibit I, where is this movie set? Like, I know it's pretty normal to place this kind of story in anywhere USA, but when Tori Hicks, the star's manager, gets in a fuss about how long her clients have had to wait in their limos, she doesn't say they'll leave, she says she'll take them back to LA before you can say heads will roll. Which makes it sound like they're probably somewhere in California. But my god, you can drive two hours from LA and still be in LA, especially if by LA you mean the part of LA where famous people live. And while we're at it, nobody says it, but it sure seems Seems like this premiere is a midnight screening. The Megaplex does a whole night of normal operations beforehand, and Niedermeyer references going to breakfast afterwards. Even if we're in, like, Bakersfield, which, do not be fooled by Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, is just about as far as you have to go before the local parlance stops calling it LA. What, did these movie stars get their hair and makeup done back at their Hollywood Hills mansions and drive all the way out here stitched into their shapewear through waning rush hour traffic? Was the plan seriously for them to hang out at the after party and then get directly back into their limos just in time for the morning rush hour? Lady, they've got hotel rooms! I know you've been sitting around for a while and your clients are entitled dickwads and it's very stressful, but go take five deep breaths before we continue this conversation. Anyway, no. Pete is not a contributing breadwinner for his family, he just likes money. Specifically, he likes the fantasy that having money would close the gap between him and his rival Donnie Holly, who seems to get everything Pete wants, particularly girls. All the girls think he's just so good looking, he has a totally perfect wife. But you are so way sweeter, Doc. Since when does that count for anything? Pete sees this not as a problem of girls not appreciating what he brings to the table, but of his own inability to provide what they need. Girls like Caitlyn want guys with decent cars, you know, money to spend on dates. Girls don't like boys, girls like cars, it's money. Fuck it, Exhibit J, this movie came first by about two years, good Charlotte or Disney Channel stands. I'm earning cash just to compete. The obsessive drive is not about work for its own sake, but about some imaginary finish line where he'd have enough money to have the perfect life he wants, the life he sees Donnie as living. Never worked a day in his life, all the girls think he's just so good looking. 
He has a totally perfect life. This is not unlike Sean, who sure seems to be chasing the dream of living like his great grand boss. Sean idolizes Niedermeyer, constantly spouting his aphorisms. To quote Mr. Niedermeyer, it is service that can't be beat that puts a butt in every seat. Grinding himself into the ground for a senpai who will never, ever notice him. All preparations proceeding at pace, McGreevy? McGibbon, sir. All right, McCarthy. McGibbon, no, no. <laughs> if you feel that your son-in-law is the best man for the general manager's job, that's a decision I will have to respect. And yeah, it finally completely breaks him. Is that clear, McNall? McGibbon. McGibbon! For once in your life, get it right! My name is... Ding! Sean McGibbon. And I did all of this tonight just so you would finally notice me. And watching this in real time is a serious wake-up call for Pete. I'm going to need a new senior manager. I'm afraid I have to turn you down. I mean, before we get too revolutionary here, this realization does come on the heels of a whole family movie type arc about how he doesn't know how to have fun anymore and he's been ignoring how great and important family is. Maybe I've just been so wrapped up with work and stuff that I haven't bothered to notice that you two are growing up to be incredibly intelligent, amazingly good looking. <laughs> Hate to say this, but I probably can learn a few things from hanging out with you guys. You know what I was saying up on the roof about lightening up a little? That's a good thing, right? And it does get capped off by the big bad of capitalism turning out to be a super sympathetic dude. I really like the rest of the night off. I think I deserve it. Good! Because I think so too. But also a dude who has absolutely proved the unmasked bad guy right. You think LaMonica will be a better GM than I will? So be it. But don't come crying to me when you find out that you're wrong. Not that I'm in over my head here, but uh, where the devil is the projection booth? Fuck it, this movie is a cautionary tale against bootlicking. I like to think Pete is about 96 hours off from a grand realization about the ways in which his workplace exploits him as a gateway to a recognition of the exploitation inherent to labor under capitalism, and it won't be long before he's strategizing the best way to carefully and not in writing encourage and enable his staff to commit as much wage theft as possible. If anything does go wrong, I'm fully prepared to blame you. All breaks and dinner hours have been canceled, which is a huge violation of our union contract. Bitch, if you are in California, that's also a violation of labor laws. As of January 1st, 2000, meal breaks are legally mandated on any shift over five hours. They can only be waived on shifts shorter than six, and if the Megaplex staff start working at three- I expect to see you back here promptly at three to start your shifts. Today, you mean? and they're expected to stay on the clock through a midnight screening, that's gonna put them easily over the 10 hour mark when they're supposed to get two breaks and they can't waive more than one. These kids are owed so many meal penalties, not to mention the amount of overtime, which in California begins time and a half at anything past eight hours in a single day, regardless of prior weekly hours. And that would include the earlier shift the staff had to prep everything before three. And that's absolutely putting you in the range where at least some of this team are going over 12 hours hours, past which you hit double time. For crying out loud, Sean is in for such a scolding about labor hours from the GM, and probably a significant cut to his annual bonus. And if I know managers like Sean McGibbon, and I know managers like Sean McGibbon, he is sure as shit not going to take that lying down. He is going to throw his employees under the bus and or doctor their timesheets, which I mean he has to be doing anyway, because minors cannot work more than eight hours in a day, even when school's out for the summer, and there are no exceptions to that at all. Oh god! Exhibit K, this universe has energizer batteries, but not child labor laws. Okay, Exhibit L. Why did this incredibly silly and wholesome family movie spook my child self so bad? I cannot overemphasize how silly it is, and I also cannot overemphasize that this was, uh, this was the scariest movie to me for so long. Fucking why? Well, number one, we, the audience, do see the Phantom sneaking around long before anyone else does, and he's always accompanied by this super intense organ music and ghoulish laughter. <laughs> Obviously, this is an homage to The Phantom of the Opera, and it's over the top in a way that I think reads as pretty deliberately comical. Like, I think even most kids would pick it up in that way. I, uh, I was not most kids. Scary music was scary music as far as I was concerned. 
I've chilled out on this a lot, but yeah, even now, it's still the quickest way to creep me out. See also my complete mental breakdown playing Immortality, documented on Twitter.com for all the world to see. It's not that scary a game, but I did have to play that shit on mouse and keyboard, if you know, you know. But the specific scene that haunted me was this one. It started as a movie, but now... <laughs> okay, man, I know, it's embarrassing, but you know, bear with me, there's layers to this. So what's going on here is that the kids have found a theater where the Phantom has rigged the projector to loop the trailer for Midnight Mayhem over and over, and Merle, the projectionist, can't figure out how to stop it. The fact is, I don't know how this trailer got onto my reels, and I can't figure out how it's programmed to keep repeating. And as goofy as this fictional trailer is, this whole scenario just just wraps like all of my greatest kid fears into one. When I was at the age to start being able to see PG-13 movies in theaters, which would have been about this moment of my life, truly nothing in this world was worse than getting ambushed with a trailer for a horror movie. Because it's not like you can decide what trailers you get to see, and it's not like you can just skip them. Somebody else picks them out and you watch them, whether you want to or not and they're so loud you're gonna hear them even if you cover your ears, and closing your eyes sometimes makes it worse because then your brain runs wild with all the scary noises, and like 75% of the time there's like one last really bad jump scare right at the end when you think the coast is clear. And now, as a horror fan, I can actually appreciate how in some ways that are very affecting of my particular brain, the trailers can be even scarier than the movie, because they have to sell you on how scary the movie is going to be. So it's just jump scares, jump scares, jump scares. And it's all about introducing the mystery without explaining how it'll be solved, because obviously you have to see the movie for that. And I know about myself now that I'm someone who, as soon as I understand what's going on in a horror story and I can theorize about how our intrepid heroes are going to survive, it becomes much more manageable. But you can't get to that point with just a trailer. That's the whole point of a trailer. And the idea of being trapped in that headspace, of even a capable adult not being able to make it stop? I mean, to this day, I have this recurring stress dream where I'll start watching a horror movie and at some point it stops being a thing I'm watching and starts being a thing I'm living. And these days it's not like a nightmare exactly, because somehow I still know that it's a movie and I know what I need to do to survive and I know it's going to end when the movie ends, but because it's happening to me, now there's no way to turn it off. I have to live through it and do all the right things for a couple of hours. It literally starts as a movie, and then it's real, and I can't make it stop. So, you know, this all sounds goofy, I know, but as I've talked about before, the whole thing for me with scary movies has always been I'm afraid of being in a state of fear. It's not that any particular thing or idea is scary in itself, it's that being scared is scary. And there might be a level of scared that I haven't reached yet that would be so bad I couldn't take it. And the idea of finding that level and then being trapped there... Whew. Anyway, you know, completely earnestly here, this has actually been a really interesting little exercise, and I would seriously encourage anyone who's interested to give it a try. You know, it's easy to approach this kind of thing from a place of, like, laughing at how silly your kid fears are, but taking a real honest look at a silly thing that didn't scare me any less for being incredibly silly has actually turned out to be a pretty meaningful act of empathy and love for myself, you know? Like, I don't have a time machine, but just being able to, like, energetically reach out to 10-year-old Laura and say, someday you will watch this movie and it will seem incredibly silly to you. But that doesn't mean that you are silly. At least not in a bad way. Someday you will actually enjoy being a little bit scared sometimes. I know that feeling you're feeling and it's real and it matters. And it's not silly that you feel it. But someday you will be able to take that feeling in stride. Someday, you will even seek it out sometimes because it matters and it's real and you'll have the tools to notice that it's also a little bit fun. You can do scary things, dear one. You can do scary things.
Exhibit M, writing this silly fucking script made me cry a little bit. Should I even be surprised anymore? Happy Halloween. This video was entirely made possible by my patrons. If you like my work, I hope you'll consider supporting it by joining those lovely folks, some of whose names are scrolling by right now. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to Alexander Brogan, Brett C.S., Datafox, Ilona Concetta, Michelle, and Patrick Berenger. 